Take your seats. If you would please turn with me to song 210. Song number 210. <laughs> Wonderful grace of Jesus.
Song number 115. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. Let's go ahead and hand out the bulletins. If you need a bulletin, slip up your hand right now. And as the bulletins are going around, we'll open them up to the inside for our announcements. Sunday mornings at 1030 is our preaching service. Sunday nights at 630. Wednesday nights at 7 is our Bible study. And this week we should be starting a brand new book on this Wednesday night. So you'll have to show up to find out what the preaching will be on this Wednesday night. We've got the soul winning times listed there below, as well as salvations and baptisms. And then across the page there, big exciting news for Garrett and Nao Kirshway on the birth of Caleb and Joshua. On Saturday, June 24th, Caleb was born at 12.57 p.m., weighing 3 pounds, 10 ounces, and Joshua at 1.07 p.m., weighing 3 pounds, 11 ounces. Mother and babies are doing well. What a huge answer to prayer. This was a, a, a complicated pregnancy. Twins are always complicated, but there were issues, there were problems. But thank God everything came out uh, well, and to God be the glory. They didn't even have to do a C-section or anything like that. And so it was really uh, the best possible outcome. And three pounds, ten ounces is great, and especially the fact that they're both about the same weight, and that's a good robust weight for being born prematurely. And so thank God for his mercy on that. And uh, be sure to congratulate Dad over there on the birth of his twin babies. And then below that, we've got the uh, note about next Sunday morning being the do coffee and donuts before the service in honor of all the birthdays. And then all the ladies are invited to a baby shower this coming Saturday, July 1st, here at the church building from 6 to 8 p.m. Ladies and nursing infants only preferred. And please RSVP to that email address. On the back, we had a great soul winning marathon Yesterday in Albuquerque, New Mexico, we had 99 soul winners and 85 people saved. So thank you to everybody who came out for that. I know that's a super long way to drive, 
And so I really appreciate those who made that long drive. And uh, we're trying to do this once a year where we go to a, a city that's far, but it's still kind of within driving distance. So last year we went to Inland Empire outside of LA. And then this year we went to Albuquerque. Next year, you know, next summer, we'll either go to like San Diego or El Paso or somewhere else that's kind of within striking distance. And so I know that's a really long drive. And so I appreciate those who, who did it. But wasn't that scenery beautiful on the way there? Yeah. Okay. I mean, that's some amazing scenery. I love that part of Arizona and just so many rock formations. And it was just really breathtaking. Hours and hours of amazing scenery through the uh, Navajo Reservation and through uh, northeastern Arizona into New Mexico. It was beautiful. And so, and, and the weather was great too. So we were really blessed with perfect weather. So we had a great time with that. Thank you everybody for coming. We have uh, the brand new Books of Thessalonians DVD sets in the back. Be sure to take one for yourself and pass those on to anybody that you know who would watch it, who's interested in it. Very similar to the Revelation series that we did several years back. And uh, Paul Wittenberger produced both. And they, they came out really good. This one's two DVDs. It's eight hours of, of uh, preaching through the books of Thessalonians with an emphasis on Bible prophecy. Another cool thing that we have back there is the new hymn CDs, volume five. This is my favorite one so far. So if you haven't grabbed one of these green ones already, be sure to grab it. And if they're not on the shelf back there, just ask somebody. We'll restock it because I know they're flying off the shelves. But, um, you know, be sure to grab one. Everything back there is always free. There's no donation. There's nothing. You just take them and, and uh, enjoy them. Pass them on as long as they're going to people that, uh, that are going to watch them or listen to them or use them. So, uh, d you know, don't feel bad about grabbing several if they're going to. A good, just don't grab them and start stockpiling and hoarding them in your house next to, like, cat food containers and old newspapers and, and junk mail and stuff like that. So as long as they're getting out into people's hands and getting played, then, uh, yeah, let's get them out there. And then uh, below that, we've got the Bible memory passage, Psalm 93. Great little passage. Keep working on that. And then other upcoming events are listed there. Uh, we've got Babylon USA, July 4th. It's going to be here before we know it. Wait, is that a week from Tuesday, Paul? Is that what that is? He doesn't even know either. He's, he, I, I'm pretty sure it's a week from Tuesday. So it's coming up really fast. That's free, of course. You just show up either at 5 p.m. or 7 p.m. The theater holds 192 people, and so I don't think we're going to have any problem with space because 192 seats is a lot, especially since there's two showings. So we really have room for almost 400 people to, to come in and see this film. So uh, I figure some people are probably going to work that day, and maybe they won't get off work in time, so they'll probably lean more toward the 7 p.m., or people who are just really habitually late everywhere, they might plan for five and hit seven. And then uh, other people who might want to go to some kind of a fireworks thing or a barbecue, they may want to go first at five o'clock and then, you know, get out in time to go to. Just, just out of, for my own curiosity, who's leaning toward the five o'clock? Put up your hand. All right, who's leaning toward seven o'clock? All right, good. So it looks like it's a little bit evenly distributed. It's a little heavier on the 5 o'clock, I noticed. But that's okay. I'm sure we're going to have tons of room. So um, I'm excited. And I'm hoping that people who don't even come to our church will show up for this. Just some of the online listeners who live in this area or people that kind of live in surprise and everything. Because it's on Bell Road and the 17th. So it's, it's kind of sort of toward another part of town. So... It's pretty close to the FWBC North, for sure. So I'm um, excited about that. It's going to be really cool. I've seen the finished product. I think the only two people in this room that have seen the finished product are Paul and myself and your wife, right? Wow, your wife, his wife hasn't even seen it. So <laughs> Paul and I are the only people in this room who have seen the final video, final sound. It's awesome. I love it. I, I wanted to just jump out of my seat a few times. I was enjoying it so much. So anyway, it's, it's pretty cool. I, th I think everybody's going to love it. And then uh, pay attention to the other, you know, uh, events that are listed down there. And uh, I believe that's it for announcements. Let's just go ahead and tally up the soul winning from the past few days. Let's go back to Thursday, which would have been the 22nd. Anything from Thursday? Th 
three for the North Phoenix Soul Winning Group, two more with Brother Jake. Anything else for Thursday? Two more over here. Anything else for Thursday? All right, how about Friday the 23rd? Anything from Friday the 23rd? Ah, one, all right. I was going to say, we haven't gone a day without somebody getting saved in a long time. Anything else for Friday? All right, and then, of course, the big one, Saturday, we already had, uh, what did we say, 85, right, for Albuquerque. Any soul winning that happened outside of Albuquerque, back here in Phoenix? My, my group has seven. So there was a group back here in, in Phoenix that had seven. Were you outside of that seven? Yeah. Okay, so seven, one more. Anything else back here in, in Phoenix? Another group back here had one. All right. Very good. Anything else for Saturday back home in Arizona? Okay, and then today, Sunday. Okay, let's start with our main group. Scott. Scott's main group had 17. Any other main teams? Madison. Yeah, we had six today, and we had six last Sunday that was unreported. Unreported? Okay. So six today, six from last week that didn't get reported. Okay, four right here with Brother Jake. Okay, anything, North Phoenix, how many for North Phoenix? Two for the team in North Phoenix. Anything outside of that? Is that Gila River? Whole team Gila River, okay, three. Okay, anything outside of that? One more right here, one more back there. Okay, anything else for today? Going once, going twice, all right. So keep up the great work on soul winning. Is there anybody who needs to be baptized tonight so that we would set up the, the water and get it running? Anybody like that tonight that needs to be baptized? Yep, right here? All right, great. Let's go ahead and set it up then, gentlemen. Let's set up the tank for baptism. We'll get the water flowing. It takes about an hour to fill it up, so we'll get that flowing. And then uh, that's it for announcements. Let's go ahead and sing our Psalm of the Week. This is going to be Psalm 11. It's on the yellow sheets. If you don't have a yellow sheet, Go ahead and slip up your hand. We'll get one out to you. All right. Some of these look like they, they crossed over to another color here. Goldenrod. But uh, most of them are yellow. Just make sure it says Psalm 11 at the top. And we'll sing this together. Psalm 11, beginning in verse number 1. The Lord put I my trust, a savior to my soul. Flee as a bird to your mountain, for lo, the wicked bend their bow. They make ready their arrow upon the string, that they may privily shoot at the upright in heart. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold. His eyelids dry. The children of men. The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked. And him that loveth violence, his soul hate. Hateth upon the wicked, he, he shall rain snares, fire and brimstone, and an horrible tempest. This shall be their cup for the righteous Lord, loveth righteousness, his countenance. Behold, behold, behold the upright, in the Lord put I my trust. All right, at this time, let's turn our hymnals to our next song, song number 99. This is one that we've never done before, a brand new song that we've never done before out of the hymnal. Song number 99, Come Ye Disconsolate. Song number 99, Come Ye Disconsolate. <coughs> And uh, has anybody ever heard of this song in your life? Anybody out there ever heard of it? All right. My wife's claiming to have heard of it. 
I've never even heard of it. What? I thought I've heard of it. All right. Well, we'll see after we sing it. <laughs> but I've been, I've been learning it, and Catherine's done a wonderful job of working it up. So uh, we're going to sing this song, 99. You can pick it up as we go along. By the third verse, you're going to be singing right along. Song number 99. Let's sing it out on that first verse. our offering plate tonight in case we missed you this morning and as the plate goes around tonight let's turn our bibles to the book of second john second john one of those little books toward the very end of the new testament a couple pages before revelation second epistle of the apostle john and as we always do we'll read the entire chapter starting in verse number one second john starting in verse number one Second John, the Bible reads, The elder unto the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also all they that have known the truth, for the truth's sake, which dwelleth in us and shall be with us forever. Grace be with you, mercy and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. I rejoice greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth, as we have received the commandment from the Father. And now I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment, that, as ye have heard from the beginning, ye should walk in it. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speed. For he that biddeth him God speed is partaker of his evil deeds. 
Having many things to write unto you, I would not write with paper and ink, but I trust to come unto you and speak face to face that our joy may be full. The children of thy elect sister greet thee. Amen. Brother Davis, could you pray for us? Man, title of my sermon tonight is Oneness Modalist Heretics. Oneness Modalist Heretics. Now, this is the third part in a series because I preached on this on Wednesday night. I preached on it this morning, and I'm preaching on it tonight. It, it just seems fitting to have a trilogy of sermons Amen. dealing with the subject of the Trinity. And I'm going to say the same thing uh, tonight that I said this morning. If you were not here on Wednesday night, you need to listen to that sermon. In fact, let me just ask for a raise of hands. Who was not here on Wednesday night? Put up your hand if you weren't here on Wednesday night. Okay, who was not here on Wednesday night and you haven't listened to the sermon yet? You haven't heard Wednesday night's sermon? Listen, I, I really want you to listen to that sermon. Download it. Get it on YouTube. And if you have, a, if you have any trouble, yes? I listened to half of it. You listened to half of it. All right, good. You're, you're on the right track. But, <laughs> You know, I'm just, I'm just making a point about this because if anybody needs a CD or something, I could burn you a CD of it. I just want to make sure that everybody in our church knows what the truth is and gets that doctrine. And I don't want to have to do a big, long review right now and re-preach all that or re-preach what I did this morning. So I encourage you, if you weren't there, listen to the sermon, listen to the preaching. Uh, I will do just a super quick review tonight, but I want to get into new material. The title of the sermon is Oneness Modalist Heretics. Who are they? Where do they come from? Where does this doctrine come from? What are they basing it off of? Well, we talked about on Wednesday night just what the book of John alone says. This is just a super quick review. We talked about the fact that Jesus over and over again in the book of John makes a big distinction between him and the Father. He talks about how he obeys the will of the Father. He doesn't do his own will. He does the will of the Father. He doesn't just testify of himself, but the Father testifies of him as well. He does the works of the Father. The Father loves the Son. The Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. The Son is going to return to the Father. And just there's just a mountain of evidence. Then this morning, we kind of focused on the Old Testament. And we showed just a lot of Old Testament evidence. Let us make man in our image. We went to Psalms and even showed just really powerful scriptures from Psalms that the apostles are constantly using to affirm the deity of Christ, but how they clearly teach that there is the Father and the Son, that they are not the same person, but that there's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and those three collectively make up one God. There's one God, and that one God is made up of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. These three are one. And obviously, it's a, it's a clo there's a closeness there between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. We don't want to go too crazy ripping them apart and end up with, with three deities or three gods. There's only one God. But the Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Father. But the Father is God. The Son is God. The Holy Ghost is God. But they are different. And, and look, we could use all kinds of illustrations to illustrate the Trinity. Every illustration will fall short, but at least they can help people begin to wrap their mind around the Bible's clear teaching. So no illustration is perfect. But for example, the illustration that I grew up with was that of an egg that says that there's the shell, the yolk, and the white, but it's just one egg. It all makes up an egg, but the shell is not the yolk. The yolk is not the white, but it's all egg, right? It's all the egg. Uh, another illustration that I think is, is helpful is to understand that we, in the image of God, are also a trichotomy because we are made up of body, soul, and spirit. So if I were to die right now, the spirit and the soul would depart my body and there'd be nothing but a body laying here, right? And if the police came to you and said, would you identify this body? And you said, that is Steven Anderson, you would be accurate. But yet if I walked up to someone in heaven and I was introduced in the soul, in the spirit as this is Steven Anderson, that would also be accurate. 
But yet, is the soul the body? Is the body the soul? No. Is the soul the spirit? No, the Bible talks about dividing the soul and, and spirit asunder. So these three collectively make up Stephen Anderson, but they are distinct from one another. They are separate from one another. They're not equivalent to one another. Same thing with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They collectively make up only one God, but they are distinct and different one from the other. So that's what we really talked about uh, on, on, on Wednesday night, this morning. Tonight I want to talk about where this doctrine came from, where the heretics in our church that were cast out got this doctrine from, and just you know, what does it mean? What are the conclusions that we draw here about who they are, what they were doing, what, what, what's this all about? First of all, let me just get into a little more scripture on the Trinity that I didn't get to this morning. Right there in 2 John, we can see some evidence right here of the fact that the Son is not the Father. Look at 2 John verse 3. The Bible says, Grace be with you, mercy and peace from God the Father. So we have the term God the Father in the Bible. It says, From God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father in truth and love. So there's a distinction made between God the Father and the Son of the Father, who is Jesus Christ. Jump down, if you would, to verse 9. It says, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. So notice the first half of that verse says, they don't have God in general. Then the second half gets specific and says, that the one who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both, both. That's two things there, right? Both the Father and the Son. You say, well, why didn't he mention the Holy Ghost? Because the discussion in the books of 1 and 2 John is about the Father and the Son because you have Jews and people that are acknowledging the Father, but they won't acknowledge the Son. And then John's telling them, if you don't have the Son, you don't have the Father. But if you acknowledge the Son, you have the Father also. Okay. So the Bible's clear that the Father and the Son are distinct from one another, but that they're both God. The Bible says in 2 Peter, flip back just a few pages while you're in that vicinity, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 17. This is a reference to the Mount of Transfiguration. And in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 17, it says, For he received from God the Father honor and glory. When there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Go to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3 is another place where the voice came from heaven and said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Matthew 3. This, th this voice came from heaven in multiple places in the Gospels, but two of the most famous are Jesus' baptism and Jesus' transfiguration. And it says in Matthew chapter 3, verse 16, And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the, saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him, and lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So here we have a great example of the Trinity because you have the Son of God being baptized. Then you also have the Spirit of God descending upon him. And then you have the voice from heaven, from the Father, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And there are lots and lots of verses. We already covered a lot on Wednesday and Sunday morning. Just of all the different instances where all three are mentioned in one verse. Lots of places where all three are mentioned. Here's another one that I didn't go over. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 13. 2 Corinthians chapter 13. And again, there's just a multitude of of examples where you'll find all three mentioned in one verse. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. There you go, the Trinity right there. Because often the Father is just referred to as God. Now, the word God does not always mean the Father. Sometimes God is referring to the Son. Sometimes God is referring to the Holy Ghost because they're all God. Right, right. And we do not for one second 
deny the deity of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. God was manifest in the flesh. Under the sun he said, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. But there is a difference between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And so when we see the word God, the context will tell us whether we're talking about the Father, whether we're talking about the Son, whether we're talking about the Holy Ghost, or whether we're talking about all three, whether we're just talking about God in general. And we can tell that from the context. In this context, because you got the Spirit and Jesus right there, we're clearly talking about the Father. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. That's talking about the Father. The Word was God. That's talking about God in general. Okay. Now, I heard someone else put it this way grammatically, and I think this is a good way to illustrate the grammar of John 1.1. 1, 1. What if I were to say to you, and again, no illustration is ever going to be perfect, but I'm just throwing this out there as an example of what's happening grammatically in John 1.1. 1, 1. What if I said to you, in the Garden of Eden, there was a woman, and the woman was with the man, and the woman was man. That would be a correct statement because if I said she was man in the sense of that she was mankind, she was human, then that would actually make sense, okay? But if I were to just tweak that just a little bit, it would stop making sense. Because what if I said, well, in the Garden of Eden there was a woman and the woman was with the man and the woman was a man. That wouldn't make sense anymore, would it? Just like what the Jehovah's Witness false Bible version where they say, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was a God, destroys the meaning of the verse. Or what if I put the in front of it and said, it, you know, in the Garden of Eden there was a woman, and that woman was with the man, and that woman was the man. <laughs> no, because if I say, well, the woman is the man, no, 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 that's not true. But she was with the man, and she was man in the sense that she was human, okay? So, and again, that's just something to throw out there as an example of how that grammar can work, that the word man can be used in two different ways. Because often the word man is just referring to all of mankind, whether male or female. Other times, man is specifically referring to a man, a male gender man. And it's the same exact thing with the word God. Sometimes God is referring to all three in one the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Other times the word God is just referring, like when Jesus said, I'm ascending to my Father and your Father and my God and your God, it, that's how it's being used. It's being used to just refer to the Father. Other times it's clearly referring just to the Son. And other times it's clearly referring to all three or just to the Holy Ghost, etc. Go to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter number 20. Let's get into the, the oneness modalist heretics. Who are they? Where does this doctrine come from? Now, one of the guys in our church that was promoting this false doctrine, Tyler Baker, he claimed, oh, I got this from reading the Bible all on my own. I just got it from just reading the Bible alone. But then he qualified that by saying that he found one verse and then he started asking his friends Rick and Elliot about it and then they indoctrinated him into this oneness heresy, this modal heresy. I believe that probably, and it, you know, it's hard to speculate between the three. They all kind of want to take credit for being the arch heretic, you know. So I don't really know which one of the three is really the, the instigator or the one. It's almost like Jonadab, the friend of Amnon, you know. One of them's like, hey, I saw this weird thing in the Bible. And the other one, like, basically riles him up even further. I don't know which one is the one, but I have a suspicion it's probably Elliot because Elliot is the one who admittedly watched debates between oneness Pentecostals and Trinitarians and was telling people in the church van and more people came to me this morning and said that they heard him talking about watching these debates between these oneness Pentecostals and Trinitarians and how the oneness was just destroying the Trinitarian, you know. So... That's where it's coming from, okay? But they all were teaching each other about this and yada, yada, yada. But what does the Bible say? Let, let's look at this first of all in Acts chapter 20. Because a lot of people are shocked by this. But look at Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing, 
shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Watch this. Also of your own selves. So he's talking to a group of elders. He's talking to a group of preachers. And he says, you know what? Even amongst your own selves, he said, shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. So he's saying that even amongst preachers who seem to be doctrinally sound, who seem to be good guys, he's saying even amongst you guys, some of you guys are going to start teaching perverse things. They're going to rise up. And he says they're, they're grievous wolves is what they are, wolves in sheep's clothing. The Bible tells us in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, that there were also false prophets among the people even as there shall be among you who will privily bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So I know this is shocking to people who maybe didn't grow up in church or you haven't really been around that long, but this is not the first time that this has happened and this is not going to be the last time right. where you think that somebody's doctrinally sound, you think that somebody believes like us, you think that somebody believes the truth and they start going into heresy and preaching lies. That's what we're looking at here. That's what we just experienced. Not the first time. It's not going to be the last time. And people are criticizing us like, well, how did you not know that they were bad? And why did you hire Tyler Biggins? Well, you know what? Why did none of the apostles know that Judas was bad? You're not always going to know. Even the apostles at the Last Supper, when John leans over to Jesus and said, Lord, who is it? Peter's like, ask him, ask him. And then he asks, and he says, it's the one that I give the sop to after I've dipped it. He dips the sop, hands it to Judas, says, that thou doest too quickly. Judas gets up and walks out of the room, and nobody still knows that he's the traitor. They're all saying, Lord, is it I? Is it I? And then they say, well, Judas just, oh, he's just buying something. He was just sent to go buy something. There's no way that it's him. Nobody suspected him. So you have to understand that there are always going to be infiltrators. There are always going to be Judases. There are always going to be heretics. There will always be grievous wolves that come in, wolves and sheep. Look, they're in sheep's clothing. Yeah. What do you think that means? It means that they look like us, act like us, talk like us. But what is their goal? The Bible says they will speak perverse things to draw away disciples after them. And this is exactly what we saw happen in our church, a concerted effort of taking certain people aside and building a faction, building a little clique, a little separate group, and indoctrinating them into this heresy, never talking to me or many other people in the church that were never approached with this. It was only certain people that were carefully selected to be approached with this. Go to 1 Kings chapter 1. 1 Kings chapter 1 is... The Bible story, and, it, and you know what? This is one of my favorite stories in the Bible. And when I use the word story, obviously it's a true story, amen? It's, it's history, it's fact. But we call them the Bible stories because they are a lot of really great stories in the Bible. And in this story, it's when Solomon takes the throne, and it's, th these few chapters have always been one of my favorites as I'm reading. I love how Solomon gets in charge, he cleans house, he uses a lot of wisdom, he deals with a lot of problems, and God just gives him such great wisdom, and it, it, he's a powerful leader in his early days. And in this story, there's a guy named Adonijah, which is one of Solomon's brothers, who decides that instead of submitting to the will of God, who chose Solomon, and submitting to the will of his father, who chose Solomon, he's going to exalt himself and that he's going to be the king instead. So it says in 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 5, Then Adonijah, the son of Haggith, exalted himself, saying, I will be king. We see pride there. We should not exalt ourselves. Whoever exalts themselves is going to be abased, the Bible says. They're going to be humbled. They're going to be brought down. And uh, he's exalting himself. He's lifting himself up. Instead of other people, you know, ordaining him, anointing him, promoting him, he exalts himself. He promotes himself. And he says, I'll be king. And he prepared him chariots and horsemen and 50 men to run before him. And his father had not displeased him at any time in saying, why hast thou done so? And he also was a very goodly man, and his mother bare him after Absalom. 
And he conferred with Joab, the son of Zeruiah, and with Abathar, the priest, and they followed Adonijah. They following Adonijah helped him. But Zadok the priest, and Benaiah the son of Jehoiada, and Nathan the prophet, and Shimei, and Rei, and the mighty men which belonged to David were not with Adonijah. And Adonijah slew sheep, and oxen, and fat cattle by the stone of Zoeleth, which is by Enrogel, and called all his brethren the king's sons, and all the men of Judah the king's servants. But Nathan the prophet, and Benaiah, and the mighty man, and Solomon his brother, he called not. This guy selectively called certain people and other people he did not call. He knew that guys like Benaiah and Nathan the prophet and David's mighty men were not going to go for it. So he kept it from them. He didn't approach them. He didn't contact them with it. He went for the ones that he believed he could subvert. That's exactly what these guys did. And I said it before and I'm going to say it again, but I'm going to clarify it more. They went after, number one, people that were in their tight-knit little social circle, their clique. And by the way, we should avoid having those type of cliques. We need to, we need to uh, socialize with a lot of people in the church, not just a certain little group. should branch out, amen? amen. So, number one, they, if they, they taught it to their little group. Number two, they taught it to people who were new to our church. And number three, they taught it to people who were young because these are the people that they felt they could subvert because they're good buddies, they're close friends. Well, they're going to be blinded by friendship, so they're going to have their guard down and they're not necessarily going to see the red flags right away. Young people or people that are new to our church are going to be easier to persuade, most likely. Now, one of these guys, Elliot, he said, well, you know, and he, and he used a lot of flattery for the McPhails, for John and Jesse McPhail. And here's what he said. Well, if I were just approaching these people that were easy to subvert, then why did I approach the McPhails? Because they're so smart. They know the Bible so well. They're so godly. You know, why would I pick them then if I were trying to subvert easy targets? But here's the thing. We're not saying that they chose people that were easy to subvert. We're saying that they chose people that they believed would be easy to subvert. Now, here's the thing. When they approached the McPhails, they were both 19 years old and had been going to our church for less than six months. That looks like a pretty good target if you're trying to draw away disciples after yourself, if you're trying to beguile unstable souls. Now look, I'm not saying the McPhails are unstable because they didn't fall for it. I'm not saying they were an easy target. They argued with them and said, let me out of the car, I'm done, is what Jesse said. I don't, you know, this is, he said, they said, this is the voice of a stranger. Let me out of the car. So this is not lit, because some people said, well, you know, if they only chose certain people to approach, they, they were, they're saying, well, I feel bad because I'm one of the people they approached. But look, that doesn't mean you should feel bad. First of all, there are, who was approached by people with the oneness thing? Put up your hand nice and high. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So yeah, like at least nine people that are here tonight that's not kind of the ones that are thrown out saying, hey, they talked to me about this. They taught this to me. So here's the thing. They approach people that they thought they could subvert, people that are young, people that are 19, 20, or people that had been in our church for a few months or longer. And so that's who they went to. But isn't it interesting that they never came to me? They never came to people that have been in our church a long time. They didn't go to Brother Garrett. They didn't go to Chris Segura. And what you have to understand is that, you know, Chris Segura, Garrett, myself, we're down here all the time. It's not hard to find us. It's not hard to talk to us when you're on staff. I know some, of, some people out there have a hard time getting a hold of me. But, you know, when you're on staff, I'm, you know, how many conversations do you think you've had with Tyler Baker in the last six months that you've worked here, Chris? No, I mean like conversations, just talking. Every day I talk to him. Every day you talk to him pretty much? I met about this. No, 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 I'm not talking about this. I'm saying, <laughs> I, know, I know that's my whole point. They didn't approach you about this. But my point is, my point is, how many times have we just been standing around here talking about something where we just, we bring up a doctrine, we bring up something? Yeah, I mean, just, it's, it's daily is what he said. Daily. 
Why? Because, you know, we're down here. Hey, did you hear about this? Hey, what's going on? Hey, I saw this in the Bible. Hey, I found this book. I mean, I'm constantly preaching to these guys all the time. I walk in here, I'm preaching to Garrett. I'm preaching, you know, we're preaching to each other. We're down here, we work together. So isn't it amazing that Tyler Baker never said, hey guys, let me show you a scripture. Let me get your take on it. He never asked me what I thought. He never asked Garrett what he thought. He never asked Chris what he thought. He never asked people who are longtime church members. He didn't ask people that he didn't think he could corrupt with it. Okay, now go to 1 Timothy 6. This supposedly, according to Tyler Baker, he got this doctrine from just reading his Bible. He was reading his Bible in 1 Timothy chapter 6. And he was perplexed by this verse. And so he went and asked his pastor about it. No. So he went and, and consulted with Garrett Kirschway. No. So he went and consulted with other people in the church who've been saved for a long time, who've read the Bible 10 times, 15 times, 20 times. I mean, who here has read the Bible more than 10 times? Put up your hand. Yeah, okay, so he didn't go to any of these people that have read the Bible more than 10 times. He goes to Rick Martinez, a new believer. And he goes and asks him what it means. And then they delve into it, and then they get Elliot involved, and they all start digging it. That's their story. That's their version. That Tyler's reading 1 Timothy 6. This was like his aha moment for modalism. You know, sort of like the story where Martin Luther's reading the Bible and the just shall live by faith and the light bulb comes on in his head. This was that moment for him. Okay, are you there in 1 Timothy 6? This was his big aha moment. He never brought this verse up to any of us, only secretly to those that he's trying to subvert and his cronies. 1 Timothy chapter 6, it says in verse 14, that thou keep this commandment without spot unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. So he read these three verses and he consults with Rick Martinez and Elliot Ray. What do these mean? And then that just led them on this exciting path of discovering oneness Pentecostalism. And led to Elliot going on YouTube and watching these debates and, and getting all the arguments for oneness from the Charismatics. And look, I got all the notes on the history of the Pentecostal oneness movement. That's where we're going next. But hang tight for that. 1 Timothy 6. I mean, first of all, I memor 1 Timothy is one of the first books of the Bible that I memorized. When I first started memorizing whole books of the Bible, I got on this plan that said, hey, you can memorize the New Testament in five years. I'll admit it, here I am 12 years later and I'm not done. Okay, I'm kind of stuck at the halfway mark because I learn new chapters, I forget old chapters, so I'm halfway through. So five, five years is turning into like 20 years on that, okay? But I'm still working on it, amen? If I had a little more character and self-discipline, I'd be done, but we're all human. The spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak. But anyway, I got that plan that said, you can memorize the New Testament in five years. And it said, start with 1 Timothy. That's what I did. So I've had this, this book memorized for a long time. I've read, I think most Christians have read this book a lot. This is a really famous book. I know when I was a kid, if I was just... Uh, they used to tell us, read your Bible every day till you get something out of it. I was being lazy as a teenager, so I'd go straight to the books where I know I'm going to get something out of it real fast. So I'd go straight to Proverbs. I'd get something in like two verses. I'd go straight to First and Second Timothy. This is a, a book that I've read a ton of times. You've read it a ton of times. First Timothy 6 is a really famous chapter. I mean, have you ever read this and just walked away with any kind of a strange doctrine or oneness? How in the world are they getting this out of this? Here's what, here's the Tyler Terrian view of this, of this chapter. It says, here's what they're saying. They're saying that in verse 16, when it says, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man has seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. They're saying that to whom no man has seen nor can see is Jesus. So Tyler walked away from this verse and said, no man has ever seen Jesus. 
Yeah. That's what he said. It's in his video. He said, this was the moment that set him to question the Trinity and led to him rejecting the Trinity and embracing modalism. This verse. Because he said, no man has ever seen Jesus and no man can see Jesus. Now, ah, I don't even know what to say. I mean, it's just like, yeah, they did. That which we have seen and heard, our hands have handled him. They, they put the, you know, they touched him, they saw him, they ate with him, they drank with him. But no, no, no. And he said, man, back when I used to believe in the Trinity, I used to use that verse, no man had seen God at any time. And I would say, hey, that's the Father. Nobody's ever seen the Father at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he had declared him. But Tyler said, then I read this verse, and it's saying that nobody's ever seen Jesus. And that's when I realized that Jesus is the Father. <laughs> I mean, wow, crystal clear, case closed, oneness, modalism. No, not so fast. Jesus is mentioned at the end of verse 14. And we are talking about Jesus, which in his times he shall show, who is the blessed and only potent, the king of... Look, by the time we get to whom no man has seen nor can see, we're not talking about Jesus anymore. And look what it says who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto. It is the light which no man can approach unto. Jesus could be approached, no problem. Handle me, he said to Thomas. Come handle me. A spirit hath not flesh and bone as you see me to have, but the light that is God the Father, the look, God is light. And A lot of times it'll say like we showed this morning from Acts 7 where Stephen looks up and he sees the glory of God the Father and then he sees Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. But he sees the glory. Why? Because the brightness, the light was so bright that Moses' face shine just from catch, catching a glimpse of his hinder parts. Because no man could even see his face and live. The Father, that is. The light which no man can approach unto whom no man, and that's God, the Father, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. It's not Jesus whom no man can see or can see. It's the light that no man can approach unto, which is God the Father, whom no man hath seen nor can see. That's not that hard. You know, why didn't he come and ask me? I could have told him that. You could have told him that. Lots of people could have told him that. But he approaches these two people that are, you know, according to their story, that, that are the ones who led him into this uh, doctrine. Go, if you would, to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. And again, we're going to get into the history of oneness Pentecostalism in general, but I'm, I'm just right now giving the history of how this crept into our church, out of their own mouths, how they got this. Another big thing that they just keep hammering and keep bringing up is this thing about the throne. It's just the throne, the throne, the throne, the throne, the throne. There's one throne. I saw one of their supporters online saying, there's only going to be one throne, buddy. There's only, you know, and one guy sitting on that throne. So this is, a, this is a big thing for them. And I already demolished this on Wednesday night because I showed in chapter five, crystal clear, that the lamb comes and takes the book out of the hand of him that's sitting on the throne. Showing that the lamb is not the one sitting on the throne. The lamb takes the book out of the hand of him that sits on the throne. But here's what they showed uh, today. It says, I am Alpha and Omega, uh, Revelation 1.8. I'm Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. And they say, well, who's talking here? Jesus. So Jesus is saying that he's the Alpha and Omega. He's the beginning and the ending. And he's the Almighty. We'll jump to verse 4. In, or I'm sorry, chapter 4. Jump to chapter 4, beginning of verse number 8. The Bible says, And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within. And they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever, 
the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created. So they'll go to verses like this and say, well, Jesus says that he's the Alpha and Omega. Jesus says he's the beginning and the ending. And then him that sitteth on the throne says, this, you know, I'm Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, the first and the last, similar things. Some of the things are identical that they say. Or they'll point to this chapter and say, well, the Bible says that him that sitteth on the throne created all things. And we know Jesus created all things. Ergo, Jesus is him that sitteth on the throne. It's the Son of God on the throne. It's the Lamb on the throne. Here's why that logic falls apart. Go to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. First of all, it's no surprise that both God the Father and Jesus Christ, the Son of God, would both say, I'm the beginning and the ending. I'm the Alpha and Omega. I'm the first and last. Because they're both God. I mean, what? that doesn't prove that they're the same person. You know, I've got brown hair. You got brown hair. I'm 5 foot 10 inches tall. You're five foot ten inches tall. I weigh about 185 pounds. You weigh about 185 pounds. I live in Tempe. You live in Tempe. So we're, it's just, we're the same person. Case closed. No, the same attribute, especially because you and I don't have as close connection as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So obviously they're going to share the same attributes. Since Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Since Jesus is God every bit as much as the Father is God. Of course, they're both the beginning and the ending. Because in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But they say, well, the guy who's sitting on the throne, he's the creator. Okay, but what does the Bible say in Ephesians 3, 9? And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. So God the Father created all things by Jesus. So Jesus was used by the Father to create all things. God the Father created all things by Jesus. So is it accurate to say that God the Father is the creator? Of course. Ephesians 3, 9 tells us that. Is it accurate to say that Jesus is the creator? Of course, because it says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. So God the Father did not create anything without Jesus. Right. Without him was not anything made that was made. He created all things by Jesus Christ. That's why there are verses such as Colossians 1, which will identify Jesus Christ as the creator. Hebrews 3 identifies Jesus as the creator when it says, For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, insomuch as he that hath builded the house hath more glory than the house. For every house is builded by some man, but he that built all things is God. Right. Referring to Jesus. He that built all things is God, referring to Jesus. Of course Jesus is God. So that falls apart pretty fast. I'm not going to spend too much time on the throne thing because it's, it's too silly. Yeah. It's too easily debunked. I'm not going to insult your intelligence. I just showed it to you. I just proved it wrong. I showed you Revelation 5 on Wednesday night. Case closed. That's the coup de gras right there. So I'm not going to sit here and just beat that into the ground and go to every mention of throne because it's, I'm not going to answer a fool according to his folly. Okay, and I don't want to spend any more time on 1 Timothy 6 because I, I already feel a little dumber just after having even brought it up. But if you would, let's go now to Matthew 28 and let's get into the history of oneness Pentecostalism. Let's get into the history of modalism. Where did this doctrine come from? We personalized it to our church, but now let's just talk about in general. Where did this come from? And yes, that's where these guys are getting it if they're watching these debates on YouTube and filling their mind with all this garbage. Now you say, is it new? Is it a new doctrine? Well, modalism has been around for a long time. There's nothing new under the sun. And this was a big issue based on historical documents back around the 3rd century, 4th century AD. There was a lot of talk about the Trinity versus modalism. So we know that there was a version of modalism that was popular back in those days. Well, over time... It was forsaken. People realized it was false. People got away from it. And so it died off for a long time. For a long time, there's really no evidence of, of anybody believing in it or a lot of people believing in it. I'm sure there were always 
people who believed in weird stuff. But in general, it wasn't really a big thing. It wasn't really a big issue. Okay? You know, and if we were to go into the 1700s, the 1800s, nobody really believed in it. Nobody cared. It wasn't a big issue. Everybody just acknowledged the Trinity, except for just a few cults that started up in the 1800s and, and, and so forth. But, and they didn't go modalist. They were more just like denying the deity of Christ. So where we see this doctrine rear up its ugly head in modern day, its modern manifestation goes back to the Pentecostal movement around 1913, 1914, okay? And I'm going to give you the history of this. Now, let me just make this clear. No, there's no Baptist church, and I did a bunch of research. Baptists don't believe in modal. You can't put, now there are bozos in our church and other churches that believe in it, but there's no Baptist denomination and no Baptist church that we can find that teaches this. And that's why I didn't ever think I was going to fight this battle. This is a battle I never thought I'd fight because you did, it's just not even a thing amongst Baptists. It's not even a thing amongst anybody except for Oneness Pentecostals. And Oneness Pentecostals have so many other heresies. They, they're so far from us, you never thought that it would come in. Like, for example, Oneness Pentecostals believe that you have to be baptized to be saved, that if you don't speak in tongues, you're not saved. So they've got some really radical doctrines. And so, you know, they're nowhere near being a Baptist, not even close. Right. Southern Baptists all believe in the Trinity, independent Baptists, everybody. So where did this oneness Pentecostal movement come from? The only denominations or large groups or churches or even just a church who believes in it are oneness Pentecostal churches. Now, how many of these oneness Pentecostal churches are there? Well... They're estimated to be approximately 25 to 30 million oneness Pentecostals. I heard one person say that about, you know, one-fourth of Pentecostals in America are oneness Pentecostals. Okay. So, don't get me wrong. There are a lot of Pentecostals who are not oneness. The majority of Pentecostals are not oneness. But it's still a substantial group of Pentecostals who fall under this. The largest uh, oneness Pentecostal denomination is called the United Pentecostal Church International, or UPCI. They have 40,000 churches. Did you get that? 40,000 churches. This is why I've run into this out soul winning like 30 times. I know a lot of you have run into it as well. They have 40,000 churches, 3.75 million members, and they have a church in virtually every country on the planet almost. So it's a, it's a pretty big uh, denomination there. But there are, there are actually a total of 1,053 different denominations of Oneness Pentecostalism in the U.S. Now, Oneness Pentecostalism, they all teach baptism must be in the name of Jesus only, baptismal regeneration, and if you don't speak in tongues, you're not saved. Those are kind of the distinctives of the Oneness Pentecostal movement. Now, how did this movement start? Well, it all goes back to the Azusa Street Revival in Los Angeles. Now... In the 1800s, there were foreshadowings of the Pentecostal movement with the Quakers and other revivals where there were people who got pretty ecstatic in their utterances and got pretty wild at these revivals. Uh, the Latter-day Saints, of course, with Joseph Smith, you know, started out pretty charismatic. He toned them down a little bit, but uh, they still speak in tongues and do all that. So, and they go back, of course, to the mid-1800s. But the Pentecostals, as we know them today, Assemblies of God, you know, and all the other different denominations, they go back to this thing called the Azusa Street Revival in Los Angeles. It was a big revival in L.A. They had like 300 to 1,500 people coming per night. And uh, they just, it really took off. I mean, it really got popular. It started spreading like wildfire. And so... In 1914, this led to the founding of the Assemblies of God, okay? Big Pentecostal denomination. It's still the biggest Pentecostal denomination today, okay? Well, in 1916, they had a big controversy about modalism. And they voted out the modalists. So, 500 and... 
20, or I'm sorry, 585 pastors in the Assemblies of God in the early days voted for the Trinity. 156 of them voted for modalism and they were excommunicated, they were cut out of it, they were thrown out of it, and they went off and started their own denomination. Okay, now how did the Pentecostals get into oneness? Because the Azusa Street Revival wasn't about oneness, it was about speaking in tongues and, and ecstatic utterances and miracles and healings and all these different, you know, wild and crazy things, and it was extremely unbiblical, of course, but that's what it was. Well, after that, this Pentecostal movement began to spread. And in 1913, you have this event called the Arroyo Seco 1913 Camp Meeting. This was a massive gathering of Pentecostals. The Arroyo Seco 1913 Camp Meeting. And in that meeting, there was some baptism going on. And a preacher got up to speak at the baptism. And his name was R.E. McAllister. And he got up and he said, you know what? It's interesting that when you read Matthew 28, it says to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. But in the book of Acts, they're always baptizing just in the name of Jesus. What's up with that? He just kind of put it out there. He didn't form any conclusions. He didn't say it's right, wrong. He just threw that out there and just said, you know, isn't that interesting that it's different in the book of Acts? Well, this set off a firestorm. So the whole modern manifestation of modalism or oneness doctrine all goes back to Matthew 28. It's where it started with a question about baptism. Why did Jesus tell them to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost? And then in Acts, they're baptized in the name of Jesus only. So it set off a firestorm. People were perplexed. People were upset. People were trying to figure out what, what's going on. What's he talking about? Well, a guy named John Shape a, a preacher, he spent the whole night just agonizing over this, praying and reading his Bible. And he said that he received a supernatural revelation from God that told him that, there's, that, that basically the name of the Father is Jesus. The name of the Holy Spirit is Jesus. So that's why they baptized the name of Jesus, because that is the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So he woke up, he got up the next morning. He didn't wake up because he stayed up all night. But he, he got up the next morning. He's running around the campground telling everybody, hey, Jesus is the name of the Father. I've got it. I've got the answer. You know, and he started telling everybody this. That's where it started. Well, obviously, you needed some big name preachers in order to pick up steam. You know, not just one guy running around a campground screaming. So some big name preachers named Frank Ewart, Glenn Cook, Garfield Haywood, they started teaching it. And when these big names started teaching it amongst the Pentecostals, it took off. It caught on to the point where the Assemblies of God had that split where 156 pastors went with it. So they formed a bunch of different spinoffs. Those 156, they broke off from the Assemblies of God. They started all their own denominations. And one of the big ones was called Pentecostal Assemblies of the World. There was another one called Pentecostal Church, Inc., Emmanuel Church in Jesus Christ, Apostolic Churches of Jesus Christ. These are all oneness groups. Well, a whole bunch of these oneness groups, they all merged in 1945 to form the largest oneness denomination, UPCI. And that's why I said they have all these 40,000 churches. So that's the biggest one. I told you about their heresies. So let's talk about this issue of baptism. This is the last thing I want to cover tonight. It's very important because this is the laying the ax to the root of the tree. I mean, this is where this whole doctrine comes from in modern day is from this issue of baptism. And of course, I'm not going to re-preach my sermon from Wednesday in the name of does not mean that there's one name for all three. It actually means by the authority of, on account of, or representing, or on behalf of. Okay, that's what in the name of means. So when the Bible says to do it in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, it's not one specific name. It's saying you're doing it on behalf of the Father, the Holy Ghost, and the Son. You're doing it representing the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. You're doing it by their authority. That's what that means. Now, a lot of people have said to me, well, you know, since... I doubt Tyler Baker's salvation now. What about the fact that I was baptized by him? Or what about the fact that he baptized my kids? Or, you know, do I need to be rebaptized? And my answer to that is simply no. Because Tyler Baker was not baptizing in his own name. 
He was not baptizing by his own authority. He was not baptized representing himself. He was baptizing representing the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And that baptism was between you and the Lord. Because it was in the name of, not Tyler, it was in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So I have always had the same position on baptism in this regard, that if you've been baptized in deep water after salvation, you're baptized. Now, if you were unsaved when you got baptized, you need to get baptized again. Because a baptism before salvation is not baptism. But if you were saved when you got baptized, you're baptized. And because and, people have come to me with this question over the years. Well, I was baptized by this guy and later he turned out to be a heretic. Or I was baptized by this guy and, and uh, I don't even know if he was saved or he's a false teacher or whatever. Look, my position is it's not in his name. It's, it's in the authority the representing what? God, not him. Right. It's between you and the Lord. Also, I'll say this, that if someone was baptized... And as they were dunked, the person said, I baptize you in the name of the Lord Jesus. That is still a scriptural baptism in the sense that they don't need to be rebaptized. Why? Because I could baptize someone in utter silence and it still be a scriptural baptism. Because it doesn't say, when you baptize, say these words. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, as you dunk. Does everybody get what I'm saying? It's sort of like when the Bible tells us to pray in Jesus' name. It's not saying that we have to, at the end of every prayer, tag on, in Jesus' name, amen. Now, I think it's great to say that at the end of the prayer, just to acknowledge to you and everyone else and the Lord that you're praying in Jesus' name. And it makes sense when you're dunking people to say, hey, I'm doing this in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. But you know what really matters is if I'm saved and I'm praying to the Lord and Jesus is my mediator, I'm praying in Jesus' name whether the words in the name of Jesus come out of my mouth or not. And where the Pentecostals and the Charismatics get this wrong, they think that in the name of Jesus is a magic formula or that it's like a magic spell, that it's a magic words, like an abracadabra, hocus pocus, open sesame, that basically if they say in the name of Jesus, that's going to give them power. But let me ask you this, and this is what Garrett, and I know I talked to some people today, they listened to Garrett's sermon and part of it went over their head. And so that's why I want to break this down again to make sure you get it. Because this is what Garrett was saying in his sermon. Is that if you're not saved, okay, and, and you're one of these holy roller charismatics, and you say, hey, in the name of Jesus, be healed or whatever, that's not going to give you the power to heal. That's not going to give you the power to do anything just because you said those words. Those words are not a magic formula. And that's why when the sons of Siva tried it, in the name of Jesus, come out of him. They got beaten up and it didn't work. Right? So the point is, I could literally say this. I could literally say, let's say we had a hundred baptisms lined up. Now, the most people I've ever baptized at one time was I baptized 26 people at the Atlanta Soul Winning Marathon. And it took a long time. It was just like one after the, who was there when I did that in Atlanta? I, it was just like one after the other. After, it gave me a whole new appreciation for the day of Pentecost. 3,000 baptisms. And every single time I dunked somebody, I said, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And I said something along the lines of buried in the likeness of his death or raised in the likeness of his resurrection, raised to walk in newness of life. But let me just be perfectly honest with you. If I had 200 people to baptize, if I had 250 people to baptize at one time, you know what I'd probably do? I'd probably say, all right, I'm going to baptize all these people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And then just start dunking them. <laughs> they get in, dunk them. Next, dunk them. Next, dunk them. Are you going to tell me that? I, I, I mean, do you really believe that you have to say those words with every dunking or you didn't say the formula right? No. Because it's not a chant of a word it's the fact that you're doing it in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. It's the fact that that's what you believe, that's what they believe. Look, when you're getting baptized, it's between you and the Lord because it's in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? So I hope that helps clarify that point. So I could dunk people in total silence as long as I know and they know that we're doing it in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So, you know, I have a relative who 
I was at their baptism, and when they got baptized, an independent fundamental Baptist preacher who does not believe in the oneness doctrine, he believes in the Trinity, he dunked them and he just said, I baptize you in the name of the Lord Jesus and dunked them. Look, I'm not, I wouldn't say, hey, get baptized again. It's the Pentecostals that made this weird conflict that isn't even there. Are you listening? The Pentecostals are the ones who said, oh, there's this contradiction. How do we figure this out? Let's pray all night and figure it out. There's no contradiction, friend, between Jesus saying to baptize and go to Acts 19, between Jesus saying to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and then baptizing in the name of the Lord Jesus, the book of Acts, it's not a contradiction. Why? Because the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost includes Jesus. Because Jesus is the Son. Everybody I've ever baptized, I baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. There's not a single person that I've ever baptized that I didn't baptize in the name of Jesus Christ. You know why? Because I baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, and He's the Son. This whole controversy, this idiot, this bozo, what's his name, uh, R.E. McAllister, who got up and said this dumb thing, oh, isn't that interesting? What are you talking about? Nobody even thought that was a problem. Nobody even cared. They just baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. They knew that the Son is Jesus. Piece of cake. But then comes this issue of, well, and they, call, they literally called it at the 1916 meeting of the Assemblies of God, the new issue. We got to deal with the new issue. But uh, I had you turn to Acts 19, right? Acts 19. The Bible says in uh, verse number 2, and I'm, and I'm revisiting some material from Garrett's sermon because some of it didn't click with people. Most people I think it clicked with, but some people didn't quite catch this. Sometimes you need to hear things a few times. It says in verse 2, he said unto them, he found certain disciples in verse 1. Verse 2, he said unto them, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, we've not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Under what then were you baptized? Now, let me help illustrate this to you, okay? So, Shane, come on up here, and I'm going to use you as an illustration here just to represent, okay, so I'm Paul, and I come across this disciple, right? And I ask him a question. I say to him, hey, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed, okay? He says to me, what do you say to me? What'd they say? I don't know. They're like, I don't even know if the Holy Ghost even exists, basically, right? Is everybody getting this? So I asked him, hey, Shane, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? And Shane's like, I don't even know if the Holy Ghost exists. I don't even know whether there be any Holy Ghost. Okay. My next question in this interchange is, unto what then were you baptized? Now, if the apostles were going around and baptizing in the name of Jesus only, Jesus only, I baptize you in the name of Jesus, sir. Okay, how would that question make any sense? That question would make no sense. Because then if I said, unto what then were you baptized? You could answer me and say, well, what's that got to do with the Holy Ghost? I was baptized in the name of Jesus. <laughs> right, I mean, wouldn't that be a legitimate question? <laughs> unto what then were you baptized? But okay, now let's think of it from their baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And he says to me, hey, I, I, I don't know whether there is a Holy Ghost. And I say to him, unto what then were you baptized? That makes sense because how could you be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost and you've never even heard of the Holy Ghost? Do you understand what I'm saying? Go ahead and have a seat. So how can you be baptized in the name of the Holy Ghost and then say, well, I don't even know if there is a Holy Ghost? Does everybody see what I'm saying? So were the apostles just not mentioning the Holy Ghost at all in regard to baptism? No, they, they were mentioning it. Now, whether or not they said the words as they dunked, I baptize you in the name of... That's what they were doing. That's what Jesus told them to do, and that's what they were doing. The, the Bible doesn't record what words they said as they dunked people. That's a straw man, okay? So you can baptize and be baptizing both in the name of Jesus. And the Holy Ghost, it's the same thing. Because Jesus is the Son, and he's included in the Matthew 28 command. 
But if you say, well, I'm baptizing you in the name of Jesus only, now that's a weird baptism. That's strange at that point. Does everybody see what I'm saying? So uh, there's a straw man that says, oh, you're saying the apostles all got it wrong in the book of Acts. No, 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 no. I did not say that. This is what I said. I said that as an interpretation tool when you're studying the Bible, what do you go with? The story about what they did or do you go with the statement from Jesus? I mean, Jesus stated one wife per husband. One man, one wife, that's marriage. But then we have stories about people having multiple wives. What's the answer? They did wrong. Story or statement, which do you trust? The statement. And you use the statement to interpret the story. So, I'm not going to go by what the apostles did in the book of Acts. I'm going to go by what Jesus said in Matthew 28. I'm going to go with the statement, not the story. Now, that's been misconstrued of, oh, the apostles did it wrong. No, no, no. That's not what we're saying. We're saying we're going with the story, not the statement. I'm sorry, good night. That's the opposite. We're going with the statement, not the story. And here's the thing. We're going to use the statement to interpret the story. And if we use the statement to interpret the story, what we walk away believing is that, oh, well, when they baptize in the name of the Lord Jesus, they also baptize in the name of the Father and the Holy Ghost. But that's just not what Luke felt was re relevant because the book of Luke and the book of Acts are teaching a certain thing that God led those authors or that author to write. There are different things included in different books because God it emphasizes different things in certain books. So in the book of Acts, the Lord through Luke is emphasizing Jesus because there's a lot of dealings with Jews and they don't believe in Jesus. So that's kind of the big thing is like, hey, you crucified Jesus, so get baptized in the name of Jesus. But there's no exclusion of the Father and the Holy Ghost. That's just a made up doctrine that nobody even thought of until 1913 at some crazy, wild-eyed Pentecostal camp meeting. Does everybody see that? And so I don't believe people need to be rebaptized. I don't believe that, that uh, the apostles got it wrong. I don't believe that, uh, that, that baptism is, uh, has to be accompanied by certain words. Now, I'm going to keep saying Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost because at least we're teaching people. People see that, they hear that, they understand. Here's what we're doing. Let me tell you what I'm about to do, and then I do it. It's just a teaching tool, that's all. You don't have to say the magic words. Same thing when you pray. You could pray and just say amen. And as long as you're talking to the Father through Jesus the Son, and you know that, and you believe that, then it's in Jesus' name. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for... Uh, our church, Lord, we thank you so much for uh, the, the people, Lord, that are, that are standing strong in this doctrine, which is, you know, well over 90% 90, 90 of people that are here, Lord, in our church have, have stayed right on this. It was less than 10% that are the ones who were led astray in this error, Lord. But, Father, I just pray that you would help every single person who's even listening to me online or people who would hear this recording many years from now to be steadfast, unmovable, strong on their doctrine, and to stand on the Trinity, Lord. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray, amen. Now, amen. look, at this time, I don't, look, I know I preached long tonight, and at this time, you know, if anybody needs to go, go ahead and take off. I understand. I'm done with my sermon. But before we're dismissed, I just want to open it up to questions, because if there's anything that you feel like I didn't cover or if there's anything that I left out, or if there's a point that I, that I failed to make, or if there was somebody who heard other arguments from these people that you don't feel that I've addressed in my three sermons, you know, is there something that you want me to talk about? Is there anything out there that you just throw out a verse that you want me to cover, or an argument that you heard that you want me to cover? Because I just, I don't want anybody to walk away and say, or feel that, you know, I didn't cover everything. Any, anybody? Yes, Jesse. John 17, 6. All right, let's go there. John chapter 17, verse 6. John 17, verse 6. Uh, let's start reading verse 5. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, which with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I've manifested thy name 
unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now correct me if I'm wrong, Jesse, but I think that the point they were making here with I've manifested thy name was that there's only one name in the New Testament that's revealed, and so the only name that that could be possibly referring to is Jesus, and he's saying to the Father, I've manifested thy name. Is that the point that was made? Well, to that, I would simply say that there are other names in the New Testament because the Lord is a name. The Lord is his name. The Lord. God. Those are names of the Father. You know, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And so I believe that the Lord is a name. And in the Old Testament, the most, the most common noun in the Old Testament is what we know as the tetragrammaton or the proper name of God uh, in English, Jehovah, right? That term in the original Hebrew is used 7,000 times. And in our English Bible, that term is translated 99.9% .9 of the time as the Lord. Why? Because in the New Testament, the, the authors of the New Testament and Jesus himself, they quoted the Old Testament where it said Jehovah. They said Lord. So that name is in the New Testament. It's just not as Jehovah. It's as the Lord. So, Jesse, what do you think about that? You got anything else to add or anything? Okay, Ephesians 4 is another one. Let's go there. Ephesians chapter 4. Yeah, I just want to make sure I address everything before we move on with our lives, move on with our church so I can start preaching on something different. But yeah, I mean, you know, there's not just one name, folks. God Almighty is a name. Think about it. Moses was told in, in Exodus chapter 6, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I appeared unto them by the name of God Almighty, but by my name of Jehovah was I not known unto them. God Almighty is a name. The Lord is a name. Jehovah is a name. Uh, Jesus is the name that's above all names that, by which we're saved, but it's not the only name. There are other names of God that he revealed over time. And so Jesus preached. He said, I'm come in my Father's name. He, he's on his authority. He's sent on his behalf. And he declared his, his father's name, the Lord. So there you go. All right, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3, endeavoring to keep the unity in the spirit of the spirit in the bond of peace. There's one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Okay, this in context is referring to unity within the local church. Verse 3 talks about unity. At the end of the church, it talks about forgiving people and having unity. Why do we have unity? Because we all have one spirit. That's why. That's what's being brought out here. And that one spirit is the Holy Spirit that lives inside of each one of us. This is not a discussion about the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, the Trinity. It's something that's being ripped out of context because the point that's being made here is, look, I got the same Holy Spirit as Dustin, as Gregory, that's how we can get along. That's the bond that we have. Same spirit. We're all part of one body. We all have the same Lord. We all have the same faith. We've all had the same baptism. We all have the same God. We all have the same Father. That's actually the context. And it's clear. Meekness, lowliness, verse 2, long-suffering, forbearing one another in love. It's talking about getting along with people because of all the things we have in common. Does that settle it? Anything else? And just to be clear, Jesse's not challenging me. Jesse's just bringing up arguments that he's heard so that we can lay these things to rest and put them to bed. Yes, Josh. John 8, 25. John chapter 8, verse 25. Say again? 27. Okay, so let's, let's get some context here. Verse 23, he said unto them, Year from beneath, I am from above. Year of this world, I'm not of this world. 
I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins, for if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Now, before I get to verse 27 that you wanted to mention, I will say this, I've heard oneness people or modalists pull this verse out and say, well, the he is in italics. So let's ditch the he, and if you don't believe that I am, you'll die in your sins. Well, there's two things about that. Number one, Jesus is the I am. Because that goes for all of who God is. I am that I am. That's God in general, and Jesus is God. So Jesus is the I am, number one. Number two, do not ever throw out the italicized words. That is very foolish because you do not speak Greek. You are not fluent in Greek. You have not read the Greek New Testament. And those words are there because they are necessary for a proper English understanding of these verses. That's why they're there. So don't you just willy-nilly decide to delete italicized words. It's a very silly way to read the Bible. If you do not believe that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. And by the way, if you leave the he there where it belongs, it's a great tie-in with Isaiah 45 where he says, I'm the Lord and beside me there is no Savior. I'm he and there's none else. Right. So you got to believe that there's none else, that Jesus is the only Savior. He's the only way to heaven. Let's keep going. Verse 25, Then said they unto him, Who art thou? And Jesus saith unto them, Even the same that I said unto you from the beginning. I have many things to say and to judge of you, but he that sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. They understood that he not spake, he, they understood not that he spake to them of the Father. Okay, how, I don't understand how anyone could have a question about what we just read. He said in verse 26, I've, I've many things to say and to judge of you, but he that sent me is true. He spake to them of the Father. What's he saying? The Father sent me. And I speak those things which I've heard of him. I speak the things I've heard of the Father. I think you were talking about verse 24, Josh. So they're tying it in with verse 24? Okay. Yeah, because that 27, man, there's nothing going on there in 27. I mean, there's, there's nothing to even talk about. This is like a great proof for disproving modalism or oneness because it says hey he that sent me I speak the things which I've heard of him who's he talking about the father um, I, I think it was more the tie-in with verse 24 with the if you don't believe that I am he is what they were really homing in on but but again I am that I am can apply to Jesus as well because he's God and the look the term Jehovah the Lord applies to Jesus as well because that's a term for the whole Godhead. The Lord or Jehovah. That, that's applied unto both. Okay. Any, yes? Uh, one of the things I saw on the internet was, was uh, as far as what was wrong with you firing uh, uh, Jacob was that you're supposed to bring in all right, let's, I know what you're going to say, Matthew 18, two witnesses, and yada, 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 right? But the way I resolved it in my mind was that... Matthew 18. That there's an employer-employee relationship, and you can fire for any, for any reason of any... Well, who hired him? You did. Who, hired, who made the decision to hire him? Who hired him? I did. Who fired him? I did. Exactly. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show this. Let's go to Matthew 18 and let's see it because this is an issue that came up. But let me, let me say this. If, if, if more than half of the church were to just come and tell me, hey, you're wrong, you're this and that, you know, then I've totally, and tell me, hey, it's oneness, it's modalism, you know, that I failed as a pastor if half my church is not even saved. You know what I mean? Like to where they're all just rallying around this heresy. You see what I'm saying? then you, you can have Tyler Baker as your pastor at that point. Because I'm not going to work with him. You know, if people have a problem with me firing him unilaterally, like I should have, you know, let the church decide, uh-uh. No, because I'm the one who has to work with him here. And it's my job to lead here 
And I'm not taking a vote on what we're going to believe on the Trinity. I'm, I am ordained to run this church. I'm a man of God here. I'm taking the church in a clear direction. And if you want to go some other direction, well, there's the door. Okay. Because, the, you know, this isn't a democracy. It never has been and it never will be. So, you know, I don't know what to tell you. And, and people say, ah, it's cult-like. No, you know what's cult-like? The oneness doctrine. Because it's, it's, it's believed by multitudes of cults around the world. It's not believed by any Bible-believing church. Oh, it's cult-like. No, cults don't let you leave. They tell you you have to stay. We tell you to leave whenever you want. You don't have to listen to me. You don't have to obey me. You don't have to follow me. And you know what? You might believe in the Trinity from the top of your head to the bottom of your foot, but you're just like, well, I just don't like the way you handled it. Then leave. Because I, you know, you, and you're still saved. And you're still a brother and sister in Christ. And there's 40 other King James Independent Baptist churches in this city to choose from. I, look, I'm not expecting you to approve of everything I do or like everything I do. Look, if, look, if you're here and you love the church and you're growing and you're serving God and you're winning souls, great. If you want to go somewhere else, then go somewhere else. But if you want me to accept modalism, not going to happen. And if you want me to work with people that I believe are heretics, I'm not going to do it. And it's not up for debate and it's not a democracy. Let's go to Matthew 18. A lot of people said, hey, this is what you're supposed to invoke. Uh, Matthew 18, verse 15. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. And if he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So right here, this has nothing to do with the situation. This is about a brother trespassing against another brother. This is not talking about a heretic. By the way, this isn't talking about a drunkard either or a fornicator. This is talking about a dispute where one person wrongs someone. Look, Tyler Baker did not personally wrong me. He was found to be teaching heresy, believing heresy, and he was failing at his job. So an employer fired an employee and a heretic was cast out of the church. This is not, and look, if, if I am down on Mill Avenue and I see you stumble out of a bar on Mill Avenue, drunk, and puke in the gutter and you're, you're staggering around, you're drunk in Tempe, you know what? We're going to throw you out of the church and we don't have to come to you and talk to you and take two and you know, you're, you're cast out. If you're in fornication, you're cast out. Now, if you repent and sober up and clean up and get out of fornication, you can always come back. Anybody who repents can always come back. But people, they overuse this Matthew 18 for just every situation. And what it is, is these heretics, they love this because that's what they say. Oh, good, because then I can get some warnings. You know, so then I can keep pushing the envelope, pushing, pushing, pushing. And then when they come to me, I can back off a little. And it's just a way where they can get around the fact that if you don't believe the gospel or if you believe heresy, that's damnable heresy regarding salvation, that we're to have no company with you. A man that is a heretic after the first and second admonition, reject. They're to be cast out of the assembly, the heretics. Okay. This doesn't say heresy, drunks, fornicators. This is a different issue. This is like somebody did you wrong personally. They, they, they rear-ended your car and they won't pay for it or whatever. Or they, you know, they lied about you or they did. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's personal disputes. So people can be thrown out for several reasons. Heresy and then the list in 1 Corinthians 5, drunkenness, fornication, railer, idolater, etc., and then this is a third category of throwing people out. So there's actually three different classifications of getting thrown out. And you can get my sermons. I've done sermons where I prove from the Bible that we're to throw out heretics. I've, I've, I covered that less than a year ago. So does that cover that for you? All right. Anybody else have anything else? that I? And feel free to leave anytime. I know you got kids and we're keeping you out late and everything. But I just want to make sure everybody's satisfied. 
Yes. Zechariah 14.9. Zechariah 14.9. Let's go there. Zechariah chapter 14.9. All right, Zechariah chapter 14, verse 9. <clears throat> All right, I'm just gonna, I don't really know what it's about, so I'm just going to back up a few verses because I always like to get a little context and get into the story a little bit. Verse 6, it shall come to pass in that day that the light shall not be clear nor dark, but it shall be one day which shall be known to the Lord, not day nor night, but it shall come to pass that at evening time it shall be light, and it shall be in that day that living waters shall go out from Jerusalem, half of them toward the former sea, and half of them toward the hinder sea, in summer and in winter shall it be, and the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day shall there be one Lord, and his name one. All the land shall be turned as a plain from Geba to Rimmon, and on and on. Okay, so the idea here is when the Lord is going to be king over all the earth, in that day shall there be one Lord and his name one. Now let me, let me start out by asking this. Are we talking right here about before, are we talking about the millennium? Or are we talking about after the millennium? Are you sure? Because, you know, there is, there is a lot of scripture on, what's that? And, and, but, but here's the point. Let's just, let's, just say it's, let's just say it's during the millennium, after the millennium, however you want to interpret it, okay? The point is that the fact that the Bible says the Lord shall be king over all the earth, and that day shall there be one Lord and his name one, that doesn't necessarily mean that we're talking about the name of Jesus because God has other names that have been rolled out throughout time. Like, for example, God Almighty, Jehovah. Those are still God's name. And here's the thing. When the name Jehovah was revealed, he didn't stop being called God Almighty. And when the name Jesus was revealed, he didn't stop being called the Lord or Jehovah. Or anything. God adds names as we go through the Bible. But they're cumulative. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? They don't replace so, the Bible says in Revelation that I will write upon him my new name, right? Uh, I, it's slipping my mind for some reason. It's getting kind of late and I'm getting kind of tired. What's that? Yeah, Jesus had a name written which no man knew but he himself. So, there's another name. And then God says that I will, Jesus said, I'll write upon him my new name, okay? So... Are there going to be new names for Jesus or God that are going to be rolled out during the millennium, beyond the millennium? The answer is yes, there will. Jesus is not the only name of, of the Son or God, anything like that. Now, Jesus is the only name by which we're saved, but there are other names. We, we still sing the song, Like a River Glorious. Stayed upon Jehovah. Yes. Okay, so he's saying Jesus is the name above every name, but first of all, why would that contradict this verse? Because even if Jesus is the name above every name, which it is, amen, but it says here, the Lord shall be king over the all the earth. In that day shall there be one Lord and his name one. So that means there's one name for God in general in that day is what that means. Father, Son, Holy Ghost all have one name. Has that already been true in the past? Yeah, because they've shared the name God Almighty or Jehovah. So why would they not share a name in this future state where, I mean, there, there's, this is not a clear scripture that says, hey, that name's Jesus. The Father's name is Jesus. It's right here in, in Zechariah 14, 9. In that day, the Lord shall be king over all the earth. And in that day, there shall be one Lord and his name one. I don't see a problem there since they've already shared a name in the past. They're going to share a name in the future. And there are going to be some new names. I'll write upon them my new name. 
Jesus has a name written which no man knoweth, saving he himself. So it's not, he doesn't just only have the name Jesus, does he? So, yes. Chapter 14, uh, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. The city shall be taken, the houses rifled, and the women ravished. And half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. The Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south. Ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azel. Yea, ye shall flee like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. And the Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with thee. And it shall come to pass in that day that the, Lord, that the light shall not be cleared, nor dark, but it shall be one day which shall be known to the Lord not day nor night, but it shall come to pass that at evening time it shall be light. And it shall be in that day that living waters shall go out from Jerusalem, half of them toward the former sea and half of them toward the hinder sea. And summer and in winter shall it be. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. And in that day shall there be one Lord and his name one. All the land shall be turned as a plain from Geba to Rimmon, south of Jerusalem. It shall be lifted up and inhabited in her place from Benjamin's gate under the place of the first gate, under the corner gate, and from the tower of Hananiel under the king's winepress, and men shall dwell in it, and there shall be no more utter destruction, but Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited. And this shall be the... So, okay, so this is referring to the millennium then. That would be the answer as we read it in context, as, we as I refresh my memory on that one. Yeah, we're talking millennium. We're talking about going to the millennium. So during the millennium, it says that, you know... The Lord shall be king over all the earth, and that day shall there be one Lord and his name one. I see no problem with this in the Trinity whatsoever because these three are one, and they've shared names in the past. They're all called God. They're all called the Lord. They're all called Jehovah. So I'm just, I, I'm, I'm just trying to make sure I understand where these arguments are coming from so I can try to resolve them. Anything else that I left out? Anything else that we want to talk about? Is we want to tackle all the, the hard scriptures, you know. Don't just throw me the softballs, you know. <laughs> and if there's nothing else, there's nothing else. I don't want to just beat a dead horse and keep us here all night. I just don't want anybody to walk away with some burning question. Yes. Okay, must someone be ordained or saved to baptize? Here's the thing on that. A lot of people say, hey, can anybody baptize or does it have to be a pastor or a deacon or an evangelist, somebody who's actually ordained, okay? Here's the thing about that. The Bible does not state that explicitly, so I cannot be dogmatic about that. However, in the Bible, all of the examples we see, baptisms are being performed by either apostles or deacons or pastors. So if we're going to follow the Bible's example then that's the only people that we allow to baptize is people who are ordained by the church to baptize. But I can't really get up and be dogmatic and give you a real clear scripture on that because there is no super clear scripture on that. So that's what I believe. That's what we practice. I think it's always best to go with the safest route and then to just, you know, say, hey, anybody can baptize. Now, if somebody, again, if somebody's baptism was done by dunking in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost after they're saved, that's scriptural baptism. I don't think anybody needs to be baptized if they've gone through it. But I always say this too, you know, if somebody's baptism bothers them, because there might have been something weird about it, that, hey, you can always get rebaptized. But I don't believe it's necessary if you got dunked in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost after you were saved. Does that answer your question? Anybody else? Or are we good? Speak now or forever hold your peace. All right. Let's go ahead and just, uh, let's just pray and be dismissed at this time. Uh, dear Lord, we thank you so much for our church, Lord, and we thank you so much for uh, the fact that we can study the Bible and, and get the answers to some passages that are really easy and other passages that might be a little more difficult, Lord. 
but just help us all to continue to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And Lord, we thank you that uh, our church is, is strong and thriving and winning souls. And I pray that you would continue to bless, Lord, as you have tremendously. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, we're dismissed.